okay, so the big come up comes out and, you know, has a cult following, but it's not doing big sales. So then you guys end up signing to Fat Possum and you guys put out your second album, Thick Freakness. Yeah. Why that name? Dan thought of the name. I don't know. We were just messing around one afternoon. He had this riff, though. He, he showed me this riff he had. And, I, and uh, we recorded it, and he's, he said, like, yeah, it's like thick. We should call the song Thick Freakness. You know, sometimes you just make up a name for the demo that you got, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you don't really necessarily mean to make it the forever name, but then it just yeah. becomes the forever name. That's sort of what happened there. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay, so, so this album actually gets a lot of acclaim. Uh, Time Magazine called it the third best album of 2003. Uh, you guys play South by Southwest. Uh, so things are starting to kind of move along. And then at one point, you get this offer for a mayonnaise advertisement in England. And you guys are dead broke at this time. Broke. Broke, broke. Yeah. And you get offered like, what, like $300,000 or something? It was, it was 100,000 pounds a side. And at the time, um, to put that in perspective for us, uh, we were playing shows in England that summer, making 100 pounds a show. Um, <laughs> just really, like, really didn't have any money. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, and our, our manager at the time was, because at, at the time it wasn't, it was considered really uncool to, if you're in a rock band to put your music in a commercial. Like, it could be devastating to your career. And so we were told this over and over again. But like, so we were told like if we said yes that, uh, you know, it would be detrimental to our career. So we, we, we took the hot punk rock high road and said no. And then eventually that happened again on some other ad. And eventually we got to the point where we're like, w these aren't even our ideals. We're just told that this is how you're supposed to think this way. And we were living, you know, um, Dan was living in a house with his girlfriend. I was living in an apartment with my girlfriend. We had little to no money. And um, we got a Nissan ad for 40 grand a side. And um, we said yes. And then the, the blowback was kind of minimal. And so we realized, though, that something happened. When we would go play shows after that, when we played that song, everybody knew the song. And we weren't getting played on the radio. We weren't getting played on MTV. So it became like, oh, we're getting paid to like get exposure. This is like a hack. This is, and what the worst thing that's going to happen is like, you know, some blog, some you know, hipster asshole is going to say we're not cool. <laughs> yeah, some blog that has a Converse ad at the top of it is going to fucking <laughs> tell us we're sellouts. <laughs> so we just like, we just started saying yes to quite a few things. Um, there were a few things we said no to. We said no to a Hummer ad. Um, but we kept saying yes, and, we, and at one point, then eventually, we became around to like you know, years later, we were not not by measured by money, but by the amount of times our music was used. We were like the most synced band on Warner Music in two thousand nine. Right. That kind of changed our career having that because even though we didn't have much commercial success or any radio success or any real chart success, we could point to this to to people and be like. Clearly, there's a market for the music because people keep asking to use it, you know. Okay, so 2004, you guys put out an EP, The Moan. Then you put out your third album, Rubber Factory. And that was the first one that actually broke the Billboard 200. Right, at like 199. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 143. Okay. Not quite top 10, but yeah. at least you're there. Yeah. Okay, and it was because of that you guys end up signing to Nonsuch Records? Nonsuch, yeah. Yeah, Nonsuch. Nonsuch. And that's a major label at this point. Yeah, it's a subsidiary of Warner. Um, we, we wanted to make this transition after Ru Rubber Factory. Our contract was up with Fat Possum. So we wanted to explore every uh, opportunity. We, so we, we, our one prerequisite was that the labels had to come to see us in Akron, you know? and. Um, so we talked to a few majors, we talked to a few big indies. Um, and the thing about Nonsuch that was appealing is that we could be on a major, but we could be only accountable to 
this label that kind of gave the artist complete creative control. There's this band called Wilco. There is still a band called Wilco. And uh, there's a documentary about them that had come out like a year or two earlier about them making an album for Reprise, a, a subsidiary of Warner, and then getting dropped. And then none such, you know, licensing that album from them, another Warner subsidiary. And so just watching the way that the none such uh, big head, head honchos, Bob and David, just watching them on the film, I think we, we had this kind of warm feeling about those guys. That like, if we were gonna make the jump to a major, th those guys would be good, good shepherds for us to help figure it out.